Well, man, what's up, guys? So, man, I'm so excited about this series and everything that we're going to be diving into and some tensions that we're going to be diving into together. But to, to begin tonight, we're going to be in several places in Scripture um, tonight as we go through a couple of key questions that people might have about God. Um, but to set us up, so I think all of us have probably found ourselves in conversations where we go, that was just a dumb conversation. Um, like some of y'all, that's your entire friend group. Like y'all are still arguing about Dak or Coop, right? Y'all are like, so who should be better? And like, that's all y'all do is, is argue about uh, different things. Uh, who here has had the argument? Let, let's go over a couple of them. Um, who here has had the argument, is water wet? Raise your hand if water is not wet. Raise your hand if water is wet. Raise your hand if you have no idea why I'm asking the question, okay? So, so what about this one? What about this one? Is hot dog a sandwich? Yeah. It's hot dog a sandwich, is it? No. Who would say, yes, hot dog is a sandwich? Hot dog is a sandwich. Who would say, no, I'm weirded out. You even asking, okay? So, but these are some heated debates. Y'all should argue right now amongst each other. Um, um, I'm joking. So what about this one? So what about this one? Um, does a straw have one hole or two? Who says one? Who says two? Okay, okay. So these, y'all are talking about it right now because here's what's interesting. We, we get in these, uh, these conversations sometimes. We just go back and forth. So one time, and then we have like the personal conversations, right? So one time, me and my, uh, my friend, I grew up with him, my best friend growing up, Justin, um, we were hanging out, and this is like, we were, I think we might have been out of college at this point. I, this was not crazy long ago, anyway, I, I was like 25, 26 maybe, uh, but, but uh, Justin, um, he was like, man, like I remember, and, and who, he just said this off-the-wall comment that I knew was completely wrong. Who here is good at letting the off-the-wall comment that you know is wrong go? Who here has to say something? Okay, so that's me. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, so about that. Uh, so he goes, he goes, yeah, man, I remember when we were hanging out with your dad and your dad had, uh, had his Coors in his hand. Cause, and, and he's like, I, I know that your dad drinks Coors. And I was like, oh, my, my, dad, my dad drinks Coors Light. Uh, no big deal. I mean, it's close. Uh, different color cans, though. And, uh, anyway, don't ask me how I know. Um, and, and, so he, and he was like, no, your dad drinks Coors. And I was like, <laughs> I, I, I just stopped and I was like, so you do realize in this moment that you are telling me the kind of beer my own father drinks? And he was like, yes, and it's Coors. And I was like, I think that we're going to have to fight. I just, I think that that's the only way that this is going to get uh, settled. Um, but, I, and I was like, I have my experience. I have my experience that I knew was true. Like I've seen my dad, um, unfortunately, my dad pretty much had a beer in his lap even whenever he was driving with me growing up. And I always saw it, and it was always the same color can. It was always the exact same type of beer. And that's Coors Light. He's a, uh, just a, a one beer man. And so, um, and, and, uh, and, and I, I was like, man, I have this experience, but I can't, like, I don't have any pictures. And so we just went back and forth and back and forth. Now, now maybe you're like, okay, well, how does that set up where we're going uh, tonight? Well, I think, I think that whenever we, we get in these conversations that aren't lighthearted, just dumb conversations, but they're, they're actually it's conversations of substance. We can kind of feel sometimes that as a Christian, okay, I have my experience of God, but, but then like whenever it comes to my friends that are, are skeptics or, or they have questions or they're agnostic and, and all I have is my experience, what else can, is there any other evidence that I can lay out? And so this series is about examining some evidence together and it's twofold, the reason why we're doing this. The reason we're doing this is to one, give still reinforcement for the Christian in the room, but also to know how to answer people in, that have honest questions and honest skepticism. And let's just be honest in the room. Um, all of us at some point in time are going to be or have been the skeptic. We've been the one with the honest question and we've been going back and forth in our mind, even though we know we have had our experience with God, we're still going back and forth and wrestling with, man, is all this actually true? Is what I believe actually what I should believe? Even my daughter last week, 
And this has happened multiple times. Um, and she's asking questions. She's a very uh, intellectual person. Just that's her. That's how her makeup is, and um, like how she's made as a person. And, and she just goes like she's looked frustrated. She's like, I just don't know. I like I just have doubts. I have questions about all this being true. And we all have those moments. And so is there anything other than just experience that we can point to, though experience is a powerful thing that we will go back to here at the end of the message that we can say is evidence for our faith. And as we examine a couple of questions, we're going to look at some evidence tonight. So uh, the evidence that we're going to look at is we're going to start with kind of um, the, the umbrella of is there a God? Is there any evidence that would say is there a creator? Is there a God that created this universe? And then we're going to answer tonight, if that God is true, if that God is a reality, then is that God good? And then next week, we're going to look at specifically Jesus and is Jesus God and how in the world can Jesus be the only way is a question that we're also going to, to be covering along with other things like um, if God is such a good, loving God, then why was there so much evil in the world? We're going to dive into that at length over the next weeks. A lot of things we're going to be diving into, but tonight, is there evidence for God? As we dive in, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 is a key verse for us as we think about why should we go into a series? like this. First Peter chapter three, verse 15, it says this, Paul writing to believers says, but in your hearts, you honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And that word defense, when it says always be ready to give or make a defense to anyone who asks, that's the Greek word apologia. And it doesn't mean to apologize, it means to give reason or logic behind your belief. That you would be ready to do that, to, that you would give a defense of the Christian belief. And the goal as Christians, guys, is that we would be able to give a defense without being defensive. That we give a defense without being defensive. That's why it says we do this with gentleness and respect as we just engage with people on some of the stuff that we're about to cover. And so with that said, we're going to go into two arguments for the existence of God, answering the question, is there evidence that God is real? Um, and as we go into that, I just want to start and kind of take the air out of the balloon by answering this question. Can I prove without a shadow of a doubt that God is true? Can you prove without a shadow of a doubt that God is true? No, you can't. But... Most things you can't prove without a shadow of a doubt. For instance, did you know that um, you cannot prove without a shadow of a doubt that everyone dies? There's like a 99.99% certainty that everyone dies, but the only way you can prove that without a shadow of a doubt is that you have actually witnessed every person die. And you haven't done that. So there's actually, like, there's no full proof of that. You could say the same thing for gravity. There's a lot of theory and things like that involved in gravity. Um, it's like basically a certainty that we all operate in simply because um, right now I can't be like, I don't believe in gravity anymore. And I'm like, like, I don't just start floating away. Like, it's still this certain thing, but I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. What's my point in saying that? All beliefs require some amount of faith, no matter how minuscule. All beliefs require some faith, no matter how minuscule. So the better question isn't, can I just prove it? But is it reasonable? Is it reasonable? Is there evidence for the existence of God that would say it's reasonable? And I want to lay out these two arguments. The first one is titled, The Cosmological Argument. The cosmological argument. And so I'm going to lay out kind of the, the, what are the tenets of this argument, and then we'll dive in. So we'll put them up for us so, so we look at it together. So the cosmological argument, um, its premise one is that everything that had a beginning had a cause. Everything that had a beginning had a cause, okay? And then premise two is the universe had a beginning. Science agrees with this almost completely. Next premise, 
And so the conclusion is the universe has a cause. So it's kind of laid out in kind of very, very, just a logical step-by-step framework, but there is reason to believe that this universe had a cause. And we're gonna look at what caused it, but with this cosmological argument, but everything that had a beginning had a cause. Science, really, what is science? It is, it is the search and the research to find out what caused something, right? That's what science does. It's trying to find out the causes of something and figure that out. But one thing that we can be sure of is that everything that had a beginning had a cause. If someone says that they don't believe that, just say, well, what caused you to think that? It's funny. Okay. Um, You're like, not extremely helpful, but it is kind of funny. Um, Because if everything has a cause and they're like, I don't think everything has a cause, what how cause? Okay. Anyway. Okay. So. According to, according to science, tough crowd, according to science, the universe had a beginning, okay? And so, and so we have here, so, so time, space, and matter, everyone's going to agree on this. It came into existence, just drawing that for us to look at, at some point in, his, in, in like all of the universe, it all came to in existence at the same point in history, and, and science is going to agree with this, and thermodynamics is actually going to agree with this, right? And so um, what we believe and what we know from what we've studied so far is that um, the world is um, expanding, and at some point, the, it's, it, it's like cooling down is what they're saying, okay? So that means that at some point, it was heated up. If it's winding down, if it's cooling down, then at some point, it was heated up. And this is where we get things like the Big Bang Theory. And this is where we get that idea. So at some point, time, space, and matter, it came at the same point. And it was through this, whatever theory you want to go with, it was some sort of explosion that happened. This is my cool explosion thing. It's not a flower. Um, So there was some sort of explosion that happened for this to take place. Now we're going to go into what caused that. What caused time, space, and matter to come into existence at the same point? if science is pretty much all in agreement that it did. There's two options. Basically, um, either someone or something caused all created things to come into being, time, space, and matter, that's all the things that you can observe, or no one slash nothing caused all things to come into being. Someone or something caused it, to come into being, or no one and nothing caused it to come into being. So the question to be posed, that's a really just honest question, if there is no God, then why is there something instead of nothing at all? If the universe, and we do believe the universe had a cause, so we, that's something that we agree on. We just disagree on what caused it. And, and, uh, and here, here's what I would say. I would say that we believe as Christians that God God is actually the uncaused cause. And you go, wait, wait, so if everything has a cause, everything came into creation, then who created God? Y'all ever thought that question? Y'all ever heard? Like even maybe whenever you were little, that's one of the first questions that you are asked. I'm asked that by, I've been asked that by a bunch of little kids and then also adults will, will ask this question. They'll go, okay, if this is true, if this all came into being at the same point then in all things that are created, had a cause, then what caused God? Well, here's the thing. God is timeless. He's eternal. This is the Christian viewpoint of God. God is eternal. God is matterless. God is spirit. God is spaceless. Like God God is omnipresent. And so, so God actually doesn't have to be fit within this, but God can be the one that's outside of it and the mind that created it. Now, maybe you're thinking right now, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe you're still wrestling. We'll get to that here in just a second. But here's how scripture says it. Psalm 33 verse six puts it this way. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. 
what I would present is to, to consider that it was actually God who willed all things that are in the universe to be. And we see in Genesis 1, it says that God spoke and then light goes forth. God spoke, to, and it makes sense that our, our world, and they, we believe and um, we study that the universe is still expanding. And it just makes sense within the Christian narrative. Does it, does it fit? And I would say, yes, it's because what if God actually willed that the heavens were made? And what if he actually did speak this universe into existence? And by the way, whenever I read Psalm 33, verse 6, note the word for God. It says, Lord. That's God's covenantal name. That's God's personal name. God is not just the one who is the creator, but he's the one who wants to be known. Up close and personal. And maybe you're here right now and you're like, man, that's, that's a great argument. Like, you're like, OMG, oh my God, Becky. Um, like you're in, right? Like you're like, I think that that shows that there had to be a creator and I think that creator is God. That makes sense for me. Maybe you're going, well, wait a second. Wait a second, I'm not, I'm not quite convinced. Um, uh, and maybe, and I would say a lot of people aren't going to be at this point, but I would say the next question is simply this. Is it necessary that someone created the universe? Is it necessary that someone created all of this that we just talked through? And next, I want to give a very strong argument for what I would say is the intelligent designer argument, that there was some sort of intelligent designer of the cosmos as we look at what is called the fine-tune argument, the fine-tune argument. Y'all still with me right now? Okay, great. So fine-tune argument. What is the fine-tune argument? It means that uh, our universe is very delicately balanced, so delicately balanced that the only logical conclusion is that there must be an intelligent designer. And you ask, how delicately balanced is it then? I'm so glad that you asked. Um, so in our universe, there are 25 or more constants. So, so think about, so these are like dials on a vehicle as you're driving. There's 25 at least of these that they've got to stay in exact ratio, these constants, for life to be permissible, for life to be able to happen at all as we know it. Um, so the tiniest change would cause us to all be decimated and all life forms would be wiped out. Okay, there's 25 of these constants. Okay, it's balanced on a razor blade knife's edge. How delicate is the constants that we're talking about? Well, to give perspective, all the numbers in history, this is because I'm, I'm setting up what I'm about to tell you for how, how delicately balanced is this universe in these 25 constants. All seconds in history, according to what the belief is right now for how many seconds there's been, is 10 to the 18th power. So that's one with 18 zeros behind it. Okay, so that's all the seconds in history, 10 to the 18th power. Um, some of these constants, we're not going to go over any except for one. We're going to go over because um, we don't have time, but we're just going to do one. But there are constants in this universe that are set in one part. The ratio is had, has got to be held in one part to 10, one part in 10 to the 100th power or more. And you go, I have no idea what that means. I didn't either. But let's go. Let's go one. Let's go one example that I think we can wrap our minds around. One of the constants in this universe that is agreed upon is the ratio of the electromagnetic force to gravitational force. The, ra the ratio of le electromagnetic force to gravitational force. It must be balanced to one part in 10 to the 40th power. So, so that's how finely balanced that this... Uh, Ratio has got to be one part in 10 to the 40th power. Some of y'all are like, man, I don't know exactly what that is, but I feel like that's about the chances of me getting a date right now. Um, and, and so, you know, hey, we, we hurt with you and for you. Okay, uh, we're going to do a dating series next semester. Plug. Okay, um, 
but one part, one part in 10 to the 40th power. How delicate of a balance is that? Well, um, Lee Strobel, who, is a, uh, who was a journalist, atheist, um, and uh, well-known, a prominent one, and he actually turned Christian through his research that he did. Um, he had a meeting with a guy named Robin Collins, who is a professor that's trained in physics and philosophy. And Robin Collins said this. He actually figured out how delicate of a balance is one in 10 to the 40th power. Imagine covering 1 billion continents the size of North America, 1 billion with a B, with coins. Stack those coins in columns that reach to the moon on 1 billion continents. Paint one coin red and place it in one of the columns on one of the one billion planets. Blindfold a friend and have her attempt to pick it out. The odds of her picking it out, one in 10 to the 40th power. And that's if it's a woman. (laughs) What if it's a guy? Guys, it's the same. We're not sexist here, come on. We're not sexist, it's the same. I have three daughters for goodness sake. The odds, I'm just trying to break it up, trying to break it up, trying to keep it fresh here tonight. The odds of that person picking it out on the one billion continents stacked with coins to the moon is one in 10 to the 40th power. That is mind blowing. That's out of this world, if you will. Um, It's crazy to think about how crazy that actually is. And there's 25 of these constants. Let's go, just for fun, a couple more. Um, the moon. So the moon in proximity is in perfect place for life to exist on our planet. And in addition to that, um, astronomer Donald Brownlee and paleontologist Peter Ward, they write this. They say, without the moon, there would be no moonbeams, duh, um, no month, no lunacy, no Apollo program, less poetry, because people like writing poetry under the moon, um, in a world where every night was dark and gloomy. And then he says this, without the moon, it is also likely that no birds, redwoods, wells, trilobite, whatever those are, or any other advanced life would ever grace the earth. Without the moon, life would be impossible. Okay, let's go to the sun. So the sun orbits, um, like the earth orbits the sun, rather, um, in such a tight habitable zone that it's just highly statistically um, improbable that our planet would have this in our favor. If the earth were slightly more distant from or slightly for, uh, closer to the sun, there would be all kinds of issues. Um, but just to name one, the water cycle that we have here, which is necessary for all life forms, for us to be alive, certainly, would not exist. It's almost like somebody placed the moon and the sun in exact proximity where they need to be. And I would say that's what scripture says that God actually placed them. We see that in Genesis, that it says that God is the one that placed them where they are. And so how thin, how thin of a blade is the universe balanced on? If you were to take your fingers and press them together as close as you possibly could, and you look at that, it's exponentially, literally exponentially thinner than that. One person said it's like if you were to take all of the raw material of the Empire State Building, all the nuts, the bolts, the screws, the glass, the wood, um, and the metal, and you were to take it and get something that would be a jug or a bucket big enough to put all of that raw material in, and you just shook it up and you threw it into the air, and then whenever it came down, it landed perfectly as the Empire State Building. That's how fine-tuned our universe is. That is very significant. Actually, this argument for many people that are still atheists, they they give this one to um, people that believe in God. They go, yeah, I get that. Like, there's got to be something because it it is. Like, I I, I get that it does look like, and they, they concede this one because it's so finely balanced. Like, how could this all be a cosmic accident? Is it? Is this all a cosmic accident or was there a creator of the cosmos? Like Psalm 19, one says, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
in the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Like what if this creation, this universe that's so vast compared to us, what if it's something God is trying to show us about himself? It says it proclaims his glory to pull us in, to draw us in. Aaron had a conversation um, with uh, one of the um, students that she's going to get baptized here. And, um, and she said that she had this conversation. The student said, as we were at retreat this year, that's the moment that God broke through to her. She said she had always had these doubts and these struggles. And he, she wondered if God was actually real and if God created her. And she said, looking at the stars, it was like this, that what I would say here for, it was like a transcendent experience. And so I know that this isn't factual things, but this is her saying that there was this a transcendent experience that I had in this moment where I sensed God speaking to me. And I thought about his intentionality with the stars. And then I thought about his intentionality in creating me. And I thought he, he must be so amazing. And God broke through to her in a powerful moment. Like what if God in this universe that he created is actually his art on display because art, it tells something of the artist. Matter of fact, like whenever we were going to Colorado, um, just a couple years ago, uh, my daughter Bridget was in the back and, and she, she looked at the mountains and she just like, Kids say, like, some of the coolest things. And uh, she just looks at it and goes, man, Dad, look at that. It's God art. And she was looking at the mountains, and, and she, she called it God art. And I thought, man, that's so true. What if the mountains and the creation and the stars and all of this stuff is actually God trying to speak to us something about himself so we would be drawn in? What if the beauty of creation is on display to draw us into the creator? What if that could be true for you, this God that I believe actually wants to be known? So those are a couple of the arguments from creation that I think that hopefully many of us could wrap our minds around. Now I want to look at just a couple of the philosophical arguments as well, asking three questions. Three philosophical questions that I think point us to a possible belief that there is a God. Um, number one is this. I ask this question pretty, uh, pretty often when I'm talking with someone. I'll say, okay, hey, why do you think we ask why? Why is it as human beings, like, why do we ask why? Why am I here? Where do I find purpose? Like, why is that something that we long for? Like, I just, I just don't think that this happens in the animal kingdom from what I observe. Like, I don't think a lion chases a gazelle, catches it, is chewing on its back, and is thinking, what am I doing with my life right now? I should call my life coach. Um, like there's something different between, like what is the difference between us and say lions? Well, I would say Genesis 127 tells us the difference. It says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Being in the image of God is why we long. For purpose. It's why we long for a purpose greater than ourselves, which is the next question. Where do our longings for something more come from? Where do our longings for something greater come from? And, and I, I read this quote earlier this semester, but I think it's just such a good one. I'll read it again. C.S. Lewis, who was, again, a prominent atheist um, turned Christian. He was a uh, professor at Oxford, very, very smart guy. And he went on his own search and found that Christianity was true as he intellectually studied it. But he said this, if I find in myself desires that the world cannot satisfy, the only logical conclusion is that I was made for another world. If I find in myself desires, then it's got to be from somewhere else or someone else possibly. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says it this way. He, being God, has made everything beautiful in its time. And it says also he has put eternity into our hearts. That there's something that God put in us, the theologians call this the theistic impulse that every person has. That's that thing that within the side, the human heart, that longs for something greater and more that I would put in front of you that is only going to be satisfied in Jesus because you were made specifically for God. That's what I, I would say. Where do our longings for something more come from? And then lastly, where does our understanding of right and wrong come from? 
where does our understanding of right and wrong come from? If someone says that they don't believe that there is th things such as objective right and wrong, you can just ask, are you sure that you're right about that? Y'all caught on. You get it. It's funny. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a self-defeating statement. It's a self-defeating statement. Are you sure that you, so you, at some point, the point that I'm making off that is at some point, we all believe in right and wrong, even based on that statement. And so where do we get this longing? Where do we get this understanding of right and wrong? Where does that come from? Did you know almost all, literally almost all cultures at all times in all nations believe certain things are objectively wrong? Murder is wrong. Rape is wrong. Stealing is wrong. Dishonoring those who you love most and wrong and hurting them is wrong. Why? We've got to ask, did it, is it just that we all happen to line up? Or is there something, if there are objective morals, then there's got to be an objective moral giver. And this is a strong argument that a lot of people try to think through, but I would say if objective morality exists, then there had to be a moral giver. In writing about this, C.S. Lewis said this, as he, as he thought about um, him, his own life, his biggest thing with God, which we're going to try to dive into more and more here over the next several weeks, was I can't believe in a God in a world full of evil. And as he thought about that, he wrote this. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? So what he says is, he goes, okay, so we go, okay, so here's the squiggly line that represents evil. He goes, how do I know that's a squiggly line? How do you know? Well, because we have seen a straight-ish line. That's why. And he's going, logically, this has caused me to realize that, man, there had to be something that gave me the straight line to compare the squiggly line to. There had to be good if there's evil. And that's the point that led him, a massive point that led him to realizing that God is a reality and specifically Jesus is a reality. Now I want to go one step further as we dive in and as we come to a close tonight. I just want to quickly dive into this question. Okay, if God is, is God good? So, so you go, okay, if there's evil, there must be some sort of, of line that there's, there's a standard for good and a standard for object morality. Okay, if God is, then is that God good? And we're going to press into this more. But I'll say this, in Genesis chapter 1, seven times what you see in Genesis 1 is you see that God creates and he says, and he saw that it was good. And then he creates and sees that it's good. And over and over again, he creates the entire universe and he saw that it was good. It gets to Genesis 1.31. He creates man and woman in the image of God. And it says, and he saw that it was very good. It's like whenever I cut into a filet mignon at Las Brisas, I'm like, it's good, good, right? And so, like, this is God. The, it presents a good God who has good for your life. That's what the Bible presents from the very beginning, the first book in the Bible. A good God that has good for your life. And I would say it's true. And here's the thing, like, you go, okay, well, why did evil come into the world then? And I would say that God is not the one who broke the world. I would say actually humanity is. That God gave in his sovereignty, God chose to give us choice. And we chose to go away from God. Why did God choose to give us choice? Because he did not want a bunch of robots. He wanted true worshipers that would choose him because they love him more. And he wanted a love-based relationship. And love simply is true. Love requires choice. So God gave us the choice to choose him or not. And we all, according to scripture, have walked away from God. And that's why we're in this broken state that we are in. But God didn't just leave us there. God actually pursued us. 
And he died for us. And we're going to talk about that. He rose from the grave for us. That's next week. And he defeated sin so he can make a way for us, so he could save you and save me. And then so he could give us purpose, give us new life, and we can learn what it is to live in that and to walk in that. What if that's true? I just want to say, what if that's true? Just last week, whenever I baptized Shelby, we talked about give a reason for the hope that is in you. Um, she, and what I shared is that she said, if it wasn't for Jesus, I would have taken my own life. I wouldn't be here. Colton just said the same thing, that, that his brother called him and said, hey, I'm praying for you. And now he has this hope instilled in him. She has the, this hope instilled in her. It's the hope of God that has kept them stable. For me in my life, on the darkest nights of my panic attacks, where I didn't know how I was going to raise a family, how I was going to be the man God's called me to be, because I got this massive, massive issue in my life. How am I going to go on, God? And God held me stable. I'm still here. If you ask me why, it would be one thing, and that thing would be Jesus. There's one hope, and hope has a name, and that name is Jesus. There's one light in this world, and that light has a name, and that light in this world is Jesus. Jesus is saying, listen, I have something good for your life. As Abigail was sharing here, up here last week, her testimony, what did she say? She said, because of God, I went from purposeless to purposeful. God gives us purpose. God gives us hope. God gives us purpose. God gives us forgiveness. In my life, at one point, I said, God, I want nothing to do with you. I tried to not believe in God. I said out loud, okay, I no longer believe God is real because I wanted to run into the sin I wanted to run into. And I ran and I ran and I ran and I turned my back on God and God chased me down and I could not believe that he would continue to chase me. When I said I hated him, he loved me and he pulled me back into a relationship with him. I turned back to God and I was so overwhelmed by the love of God because I was the guy that was laughing on the outside but was empty on the inside. And Jesus, he called me back into a relationship with him and I said yes. And it changed everything for me. I experienced his forgiveness. Matter of fact, on my socials, I changed my name to Forgiven after that. MySpace was a thing back then, that's how old I am. Purpose, hope forgiveness. And you go, okay, why, why would this God do all this? And because God loves you. This is the cute little Devo that I read to my daughters every night. Um, and last night, actually, this is the Devo. And I think it was so fitting. It says, sometimes people have difficulty believing God is a God of love. They ask, how can he be when the world is filled with so much suffering? If you ever wonder whether God is love, look at the cross. It was love that led Jesus to the cross. It was love that held him back whenever he was falsely accused of blasphemy. It was love that led him to Golgotha to die with common thieves. He could have called armies of angels to come to his defense, but it was love that kept him from raising a hand against his enemies. It was love that made him pause despite his own pain to give hope to a repentant sinner on a cross beside him who cried, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It was love that caused Jesus to lift his voice and pray, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Does that God love us? Yes. If you want proof, man, never leave the cross. You see it so clearly. This God loves you and he has something for your life. Will you say yes to that love? That love that's based on evidence, by the way. And Christian, as we close, I wanna say this. Do you live like you really believe in Jesus? You say, yeah, I believe this evidence is real. And I believe that Jesus actually is the Messiah of this world, the one who was sent to save. Do you actually believe in Jesus? Brennan Manning said this, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. If you are uh, claiming to be a follower of Jesus, like are you living the life that Jesus died to give you? Because he would love to give you that life. Love for us to walk in it. Listen, the greatest apologetic argument for your faith is your life. 
the greatest apologetic for your faith as a Christian is your life. Let's pray, God. People that have more questions, Lord, I pray that they would not be afraid to ask them, press into them. Lord, I pray that you yourself would speak to people because I do believe that you're a God who speaks to us in our hearts. I pray that for us that are believers that we would better know how to engage in conversations when people have just honest doubts and questions. And God, we come to you right now just saying, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Let's worship God. Let's stand and worship.